Robinson dies alone in his Los Angeles home. He leaves behind a half a million dollars worth of property and a will that's not worth the paper it's written on. I knew that things were not right. You know, you trust people implicitly. And people can lie. The brazen theft of a valuable estate will cast new light on a family's mysterious past. A past that includes deception and murder. You have to have a death certificate in order to be dead. I mean, you know, where's the grave? And a mystery 50 years in the making. February 1996. 75 year old Wilbur Robinson dies of lung cancer at his home in Crenshaw, Los Angeles. Wilbur is a widower with no children of his own. 1,000 miles to the north, his sister, Elnita, hears the news at her home in Seattle, Washington. Wilbur's death does not come as a surprise. The nurse called me and told me I had seen Wilbur a year before then. I went down, and he was dying of cancer at that time. Six months later, Wilbur was sick again, and they told me that he was going to make it. Wilbur and Elnita were born into a large family in the port town of Lake Charles, Louisiana. That was uh, Wilda, James, Wilbur, and myself. I'm the fourth child. Walter, Joseph, uh, Richard, Noble, and Rosemary. There was nine of us. As the years passed, the Robinson siblings were scattered across the United States. Over the years, they lost touch but Elnita always stayed close to Wilbur, who after spending 25 years in the U.S. Navy, ended up in the Los Angeles neighborhood of Crenshaw. Wilbur was married twice, but never had any children of his own. At the time of his death, most of his brothers and sisters are also presumed dead. We thought there was just two people living, Joseph who lived in Lake Charles, and me who lived here in Seattle. Wilbur's one remaining brother, Joseph, is in poor health. So Elnita flies to LA to put Wilbur's affairs in order. She is shocked by the state of his home in Crenshaw. I considered a disaster. It was not clean, and he had cancer, and that order was all over that house. Despite the chaos, Wilbur seems to have been extremely careful with his money. He had lots of insurances, and he had money. He had a fairly good retirement. He also had money in the credit union. He told me that. Since Wilbur's wife had already died, Elnita assumes the estate will be inherited by Wilbur's remaining siblings. He told me, he made up his will, it was for the family trust, was, that's what his name. In a trust, a family member is usually given the power to distribute the estate to the heirs without going through expensive court proceedings. Gary Spicuza is a specialist in estate planning. A trust avoids the probate court system. It is a private disposition of your property rather than a public one through the probate court system. In his trust, Wilbur authorizes three people to look after the distribution of his assets. Elnita, Wilbur's stepdaughter Dolores, and a cousin, Joanne. I believe Mr. Robinson did the exact correct thing by having three uh, successor trustees with, a, with 
undoubtedly a majority before any decisions were made. Then you have everybody looking over everybody's shoulder and make sure everything is done correctly. Dolores also lives in Seattle. When visiting Wilbur in LA, she had seen the trust paperwork for herself. He had left me a little money and then so much for uh, other close friends of his. But his sister was the one that was a beneficiary. Everything, you know, would be done at her discretion. Wilbur's trust is worth several hundred thousand dollars. He had a huge stamp collection. He had uh, all kind of coins. He had a gun collection that, from what I understand, was something to see. He loved Lincoln Continentals, and that's what he had. He had a beautiful Lincoln Continental. He had lots of insurance that were payable on his death. On February 9th, 1996, Wilbur Robinson is laid to rest. I made arrangements for his funeral. He was buried at a cemetery there in LA. It's called Riverside for veterans. He had retired from the Navy for 25 years. They gave me Wilbur's flag. After the funeral, Dolores, Wilbur's stepdaughter, joins the rest of the mourners at Wilbur's home. We went to his house and we sat there and we talked, you know, and reminisced about him and looked around and his nephews, they were just taking stuff. He had pictures on the wall. He had paintings. His sister and her husband and I, we're all sitting there watching him. You never expect to see anything like that. And it was an eye opener. Husband, stepfather, and brother, Wilbur was a lively and eccentric presence in the Robinson family. Everybody just loved him. He was a friendly person. And he loved to garden. He lived out in the outskirts of Los Angeles. So he had chickens and turkeys and all kind of stuff like that. He just lived like a, a slob. But I loved him. He was still my brother. 15 years younger than his wife, Wilbur was roughly the same age as his stepdaughter, Dolores. I liked him, I thought he was very flamboyant, but he was a wonderful person. Had a lot of fun with him. Um, he would do anything for you, and he'd do anything that even if you didn't know you needed it, he would do that for you too. But like I told him, I said, as long as he made my mother happy, that is all that I cared about. At the age of 72, Wilbur's lifelong smoking habit caught up with him. I called him and I asked him how he was doing. I said, I haven't heard from you. He said, well, I've been in the hospital. And I said, why didn't you call me? He said, well, I didn't want to worry you. I said, well, is everything OK? And he said, well, I might as well tell you. And that's when he told me he had lung cancer. And I just broke down crying. As the cancer developed, Dolores kept a close eye on Wilbur's progress. He dealt with it very well. And up until about maybe four months, then he took a turn for the worse. He couldn't take care of himself. But I found that out when I went to California. He always like he was fine. But it wasn't. And he drank a lot. He had a lot of drinking friends. <laughs> As Wilbur's health declined, professional caregivers were hired to look after him. 
he had caregivers, and the ones that I met were just wonderful people, took very good care of him, very good care of him. And then he had a neighbor next door that was very good to him too. Everyone around Wilbur noticed that his mind was beginning to deteriorate. He did get confused somewhat. You know, that's to be expected, you know, and that that was going to happen. A caregiver was there, and she asked me, did I want some coffee? I said, yes, I'd like a cup of coffee. And he called me, Francis, Francis, that was my mom. And I said, no, honey, it's Dolores. And I went in and sat down next to him. He said, when'd you get here? I thought I heard Francis. I said, no, that was me. Luckily, Wilbur was prepared. With the help of his lawyer, he had already drawn up both a will and the papers to establish the family trust. He did tell me about the will, and he took it out and showed it to me. And uh, basically, you know, when a person makes a will, you're supposed to honor it. And as far as I knew, uh, like he told me, you're not going to have to worry. That wasn't the point. The point for all of us was getting him back on, our, on his feet again. But we knew Wilbur was very ill. We knew he was very, very ill. And increasingly vulnerable to outside influence. He was a very trusting person. A very trusting person. He was of the old school, your word is who you are. And that's what you know, he was all about. In the months before his death, Wilbur is surrounded by caregivers, nurses, lawyers, neighbors, and family members. but it's the person whom he trusts the most that will take full advantage of his confusion and fragility. Navy veteran Wilbur Robinson leaves behind a surprisingly valuable estate, including his suburban home, antique collections, and a treasured Lincoln Continental wealth that his immediate family assumes will be passed on to them. The Robinson Family Trust was set up by a Beverly Hills lawyer, Robert Cannon. Wilbur had been a client for several years. At the funeral, Robert Cannon clearly considers himself part of the family. But this feeling is far from reciprocal. Cannon come and got in the car that we were in, and we were not happy about it. But when he came in and sat down, I wanted to say something, but you know, I didn't want to start anything. But my son-in-law did tell him, and he got out and uh, got into the, the first limo. I'll be very frank with you, I didn't like the man, I didn't trust him. There was something about him that wasn't right. People say I'm a pretty good judge of character. I like people. But if I kind of sense something wrong with you, I don't have anything to say to you. And he was trying to talk, and I just would not talk to him. By 1995, as Wilbur's health started deteriorating, the attorney began to exert more influence over his client's life, including his daily expenses. I told everybody I didn't trust this lawyer. He said, you don't know what you're talking about. You live in Washington, and I live in California. And that's the way he told me. I should tend to my own business. Well, he said he's a good man. He said, you know, he's, a, he's been in the Navy. He's a real good man. But what can you say? I mean, he trusted the man, so there was nothing for, more for me to say. If I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, I would say, well, look, his sister is elderly, and in Washington State, she is not gonna take care of him. The other brother is in Louisiana. He's not taking care of him. We don't know where anybody else is. Who is gonna help this man financially? And, you know, 
it appears that maybe the guy, he must have done some good for him. He did manage his financial affairs. He did probably pay the bills on the house, make sure the taxes were paid and, and uh, medical bills and, and, and those kind of things. But that's what you would expect if you're a professional thief. I knew that things were not right. You know, when his, his lawyer left town and left no money, and he called me to send him $500 until his lawyer come back. Wilbur had about three or four bank accounts. Now, Wilbur wasn't able to go any place, but there were so many withdrawals, it didn't make sense. I was concerned about all the withdrawals that were on, not just one, but all three of them. He'd just say, well, Cannon, he called him Cannon. He knows all about it. I even called the bank and asked them what happened. And they said, well, the lawyer, you know, had come down and drawn out money for this or that. A few months before Wilbur's death, Dolores finally summoned Robert Cannon to a meeting with a social worker. I called Cannon's office the day after I arrived, and I was told that he was very busy and they didn't know whether or not he could make it, but he showed up for the meeting. Cannon's explanations did not impress Dolores. What he was saying about some of the answers he gave, I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. So then when it come my turn, I asked him why he went on a vacation and left him with no money. He said he left him money. I said, where was it? And he said, in the briefcase. And I asked Wilbur where the briefcase was and he pointed it out to me. He opened it and there was nothing in it. There was nothing, just a big empty briefcase. As the family grew increasingly suspicious, Cannon reassured them that the estate would be properly handled after Wilbur's death. Cannon, after everybody, everybody left, was talking about him and explaining there was a trust and that his sister Elnita was the main person, and that I was getting something too. I said, well, you know, is that the will or the trust? And he said, well, it's a trust. Well, I was at my wit's end. I didn't, I thought a will was a will. I didn't, I thought tr the trust was something else. The difference is critical. A trust, unlike a will, allows for a trustee to handle the estate privately without the supervision of a judge. Dolores takes comfort in this, but not for long. A few days after the funeral, Elnita returns to Seattle. A package arrives at her home. She is shocked by its contents, legal documents stating that she is no longer one of Wilbur's trustees. Apparently, at the very end of his life, Wilbur had given Robert Cannon complete control over his estate. I just think he's a louse. He's nothing but a thief. That's what he is. That's what I think about him. Kenneth had made himself uh, the executor and had the power of turning everything. So when someone is under duress, it's pretty easy to exert undue influence on them. You know, Wilbur, I've been your attorney for, for 10, 15 years now. You know, I'll make sure everything is done just the way it is. You know, you want to do it. Uh, you know, the only thing that's going to change with your trust is that I'm going to be your successor trustee, <laughs> which means I'm handling everything. The family members are, in theory, still the beneficiaries of the trust. But as the sole trustee, Cannon legally has the power to sell off Wilbur's assets, a power that can be easily abused. The bottom line is, it is extremely suspicious when an attorney an insurance agent, a stockbroker, a CPA, injects themselves and makes themselves the, the successor trustee because the trustee of a trust is all powerful. 
the family finds themselves powerless to intervene. Cannon has full control. But I, I imagine gradually, you know, he'd go over there to check on the house because there was nobody in the house. And he had a key to the house. So I guess, you know, he'd go over there. And I'm assuming he'd take what he wanted. Cannon even has access to Wilbur's locked safe. He had a key to that. Wilbur's stamp collection, which was very valuable. When you get into things like precious metals, uh, that you just have gold bars or silver bars, antique gun collections, these are all very valuable things, but there's no title to it. Without title or legal proof of ownership, there is no proof of its value. So those types of assets, when you're to talking about the total inventory value of the estate being three to 500,000, but a lot was antique gun collections and, and, and uh, other types of assets. It's hard to value those things. So that makes uh, something very um, easy for an unscrupulous successor trustee to be able to convert to cash for his own, for his own uses. Wilbur's house is promptly sold. His car, his furniture, and his antique collections all disappear. The proceeds of the sale should have been placed in the trust account, but were they? Now the question is, did he start stealing uh, immediately? Well, well, yes, but, but you don't know that immediately. I mean, uh, he gifted himself, um, I believe, an antique gun collection and a, and a Lincoln Continental car and those kind of things. The attorney gifted that to himself. When you read the trust document, it's not going to say, hey, I'm giving something to attorney Robert Cannon, it's going to say, I, I, I'm gifting these things to the successor trustee. Elnita is frantic. She repeatedly tries to contact Robert Cannon. I wrote him many letters to tell him why wasn't he taking care of this trust, and he never returned them, never. He never would call me. And I told him it was a crook, <laughs> you know? And he sure didn't answer them. Cannon seems to vanish into thin air. After several months and no response to her letters, Elnita hires another Los Angeles lawyer to investigate. He looked in this through all the papers I sent him. Elnita's attorney, Owen Brady, speaks to Cannon on the telephone. Cannon assures him that the estate will be accounted for and distributed. Brady writes numerous letters and even files a complaint with the State Bar of California, but to no avail. Elnita was right on top of this. She knew something was wrong within months. She hired Mr. Brady, but Mr. Brady goes on a letter writing campaign. What the hell good is that going to do for, for Elnita? Nothing. A Superior Court judge has the power. It's all Mr. Brady would have had to do was file a simple petition and ask a judge to remove uh, Cannon as the successor trustee because there is the appearance of impropriety. A judge is going to err on the side of caution. Brady does not take Elnita's case to court, saying that bringing a lawsuit against Cannon will be too expensive but Spacusa believes the trust documents should have been challenged in a court of law. When, when the maker of a document is under duress, if you've got two months to, to live, you're under duress, and when someone is compelling you by way of undue influence and exploitation of the elderly, that makes them illegal. Sadly, Elnita's lawyer admits defeat without ever going to court. He told me that he was sorry after a year, but he couldn't help me because Cannon had taken everything. And I had paid him over $3,000. I think there's a lot of people learn from this. You know, you trust people implicitly, and people can lie. Elnita, Dolores, and the rest of the family resign themselves to the fact that a half a million dollar estate has been stolen from under their noses. 
But soon, Elnita will be given new hope of retrieving missing money and of finding long-lost family presumed dead. My friends told me that they believe that he was, he was alive. And, and it, it was believed in my heart, I was, I was hoping he was alive, you know? Ten years pass, and the loss of Wilbur Robinson's estate is a dim memory for his sister, Elnita. Their other brother, Joseph, has also passed on, and the lawyer who robbed her family of their inheritance has disappeared without a trace. But two and a half thousand miles away from Wilbur's final resting place, asset locator Margaret Galasso is working a new case, a case that will rewrite the history of the Robinson siblings. Her job is to track down the owners of unclaimed assets and money. Anywhere from um, checking accounts, savings accounts, stocks, bonds, um, that sort of thing. And I would locate the, the person, uh, the, the funds, and then I would locate the, individual, the individuals that are entitled to the funds. At her office in Spring Hill, Florida, Galasso comes across a so-called orphaned bank account that has not been used for several years. It contains almost $70,000. If she is successful in finding the owner, Galasso will get 10%. The, the account was under the name of, I think it was Robert C. Cannon, and it had uh, Robinson Family Trust. I didn't have any clue of what, what was to come. Basically, I was just doing an average day you know, situation, and um, that was about the size of it. Galasso discovers she is not the first person to inquire about this account. The controller's office has already received a claim from none other than Wilbur's long-lost lawyer, Robert Cannon. One of the people told me over there that um, he did try to access this money, and he um, sent in a claim for these funds that he, he was not entitled to those funds. And so that's why he wasn't, uh, he was denied those. Although Cannon was the trustee, he was not the official beneficiary. Galasso believes he did his best to get at the money. But he also, you know, he also lied on the forms because he didn't have the proper stuff. You know, he, um, he was saying he was the owner. The rejected application immediately raises a red flag. Galasso attempts to reach Cannon, but that lead goes nowhere. Instead, she tracks down the last known address that's listed on the account. I ran down the P.O. box, um, and um, it came up with Wilbur Robinson's address um, in Los Angeles. Last known addresses are very important um, because you can also uh, call neighbors. You know, sometimes neighbors are very helpful, uh, and I happen to come across a neighbor who said, yes, well, the person died and they knew the person, uh, but they also had told me that there was a sister. And they might have said that her name was Elnita or Renita. So I started looking for somebody like that in, you know, Washington State, because that's where they said that they were from. And so it took me a while to try and, and, and get a phone number to call this individual. For Elnita, who believed that her brother's estate had been completely plundered, Margaret's call is a shock. And I said, well, I'm calling on, on I'm a finder asset locator, air finder. This is not some joke or some scam, this is for real. Um, there's 60 something thousand dollars here. Um, and basically, you know, she may be one of the heirs to the estate. Elnita can take comfort that a small part of her brother's last will was not tainted by theft or corruption. No, he didn't get that. I'm glad he didn't, you know? It wasn't that much money. It was only 69000 but that is better than nothing. But in order to access the money, Margaret needs to make a complete list of Wilbur's potential heirs. Since the death of her brother Joseph a few years earlier, Alnita believes she is Wilbur's only remaining sibling. In order for you to claim any of those funds, because you have to prove to the state 
um, you know, who the heirs are to the, to the estate. But then when I got into this whole thing, um, some things didn't add up. I said, are you sure that all your brothers and sisters are dead? Because she didn't have all of the death certificates. I said, you don't have all the death certificates? And then she started telling me about her, you know, brothers and sisters. Elnita and her eight siblings grew up during the Great Depression in Lake Charles, a port town on the western fringe of Louisiana. My father raised chickens. He made a garden. My mother could do anything with food. <laughs> she was an excellent cook. She died young. She died at 54 of a heart attack. But my mother, I never went hungry. And it was a wonderful family. My father was a longshoreman. So when he did work, he made money. But my mother could manage anything. She could make anything. She was just a wonderful woman. I have a lot of her characteristics myself. Elnita's two sisters, Viola and Rosemarie, both died in 1980. She had six brothers, James the oldest, Wilbur, Walter, Joseph, Noble, and finally, Richard the youngest. All of the brothers joined the armed forces. Wilbur was the first to sign up. Wilbur went into the Navy and he went into the Navy when he was 16 years old. And my mother didn't even sign for him, but he had someone to sign. And that's how he went into the Navy. Richard Robinson, Elnita's youngest brother, followed in Wilbur's footsteps. With long stretches overseas, regular contact was difficult. In 1959, when Wilbur and Richard were back on shore leave, some of the siblings organized a get-together. 59, when I went to Los Angeles, we had my sisters were there, and Wilbur, and Richard, and they had my sister, my oldest sister, fix a dinner for us in Los Angeles. That was a happy occasion that we all were together. I got the pictures of all those taken at that time. Alnita stayed in touch with Wilbur, but this photograph, taken in 1959, would be her last memory of her youngest brother, Richard, who went overseas and was never heard from again. Richard was the second brother to lose contact with his family. Walter, who also served in the Navy, hadn't come to visit in years. He never called me. He was kind of on the wild side. The boys were tough. <laughs> they really was. They chased women and you know, he was in the Navy, He's, he stayed in a long time. After 50 years, Elnita assumes that Walter and Richard, like the rest of her siblings, are dead. And indeed, through the legal proceedings, Margaret Galasso finds out that Walter and Richard were both declared legally dead in 1992. But a familiar name on the declaration raises a red flag. Both brothers were declared dead by Robert Cannon, Wilbur's lawyer. Galasso believes he wanted to transfer the deeds of their parents' home in Lake Charles. Cannon wanted to get his hands on, on the homestead that they had um, in Louisiana. And I think that that's what was, that was what was interesting to me, that he declared both of them legally dead so that he could m do a quick claim deed to the property but I still had no evidence that Walter or Richard were dead because I had no death certificates. You have to have a death certificate in order to be dead. I mean, you know, where's the grave? Knowing that Cannon was involved in declaring them dead causes Elnita to have her own doubts. Could her two long lost brothers still be alive? I was still concerned about Richard. That was my mother's heart. I had a friend that lived here in Seattle. She told me, Elnita, he's alive. She said, you're gonna see him again, you know? 
If you live long enough. How do you tell somebody that somebody was murdered? Eighty-year-old Elnita believes she is the only living Robinson sibling. That is, until professional air finder Margaret Galasso contacts her about $70,000 that belonged to the plundered family trust. But to release the money, she needs to track down death certificates of two of Elnita's brothers, thought to be dead, Walter and Richard. Galasso does not have much to go on. And she said, well, the last time I saw Richard was somewhere around 1959. And as far as Walter was concerned, she says, God, I don't know where the heck he is. I don't have a clue. She says, all I know is that the last time I saw um, him, um, he came to my house and I gave him some money. But all I know is that he was living somewhere on an Indian reservation, somewhere in Yuma, Arizona, with, an, uh, with a, a Native American woman. Um, there may be possibly a son out there that I have no clue of who he is. So, I mean, if he's out there somewhere, I hope he contacts me, because I'd love to settle his part of the case. Instead of confirming they're dead, Galasso hopes she may end up proving the Robinson boys are alive. First of all, Elnita had given me um, yeah, birth dates. Okay, I mean, I must have called hundreds of different Walter Robinsons in Yuma, Arizona. All right, and they never, none of them checked out. But the birth year was wrong. I called the Indian Nation. That was my next step because they all have census records and the rest of it. And I said, look, I'm looking for somebody named Walter Robinson supposedly married to some lady who is an, who's a Native American Indian. Um, they may or may not have a child or two, I don't know. Possibly a son, don't know. Nothing came up. Galasso checks Yuma's city records and contacts the coroner's office. Finally, a secretary at the police department gives her some solid information. I called over there and they were saying that they that there was a Walter uh, Robinson that they had or had handled the case um, that was a was in a pauper's grave. They said that basically he was deceased. I didn't believe that he was alive. I didn't, you know, from his lifestyle, the living on a reservation. And I'm sure he was drinking. It's a huge disappointment for Galasso. Walter had died penniless and alone. But it gets worse. The, um, the secretary over there gave me the, um, the, um, the funeral home's uh, name. Well, and that took some doing, too, because I had to call different places because some of those names had changed. Because now it goes back to 1981. Um, finally, the lady said, well, this is what it is. She sent me the, the death certificate. Wow, that blew me away. Because on the death certificate, it, it clearly states that it's a homicide. He was shot through the left side uh, aorta, and it states that he was shot with a 22 gauge, and that he was found in the seat of a car. They did catch his murderer, that she was, was some lady by the name of Ruth Watkins, that they had some kind of an argument. They don't know what the argument was about. The lasso calls Elnita with the news. How do you tell somebody that somebody was murdered? You know, I, I called her and I said, look, I think I found Walter. And um, I think, you know, he's deceased. She took it very well. But then I had to lay the bomb, you know, which I, I said, you know, I hate to tell you this, but um, he didn't die of natural causes. I figured 
Well, he lived a pretty tough life. And maybe that's because he was supposed to die like that. And the kind of life he lived, that could happen, you know? Alnita is still left with one hope, and it rests on her youngest brother, Richard. I was still concerned about Richard. That was my mother's heart. Richard and Rosemarie, that's a young, a last children. And she cared for those children. She loved them. In my heart, I was, I was hoping he was alive. Margaret doggedly persists in her quest to discover what happened to Richard. In order to release Wilbur's account, she needs to find him, dead or alive. She had said to me that he, you know, you know, that he was in the Navy in, in, and that he lived in Long Beach at one time, and that's all I knew at that point. And I must have called hundreds of Robinsons, um, you know, Richard Robinsons, um, all throughout, you know, um, you know, California and the rest of it. The thing of it is, is that I also was looking for somebody specific. I was looking for somebody who was African American, which I knew. But I had one thing that most people didn't have, which was the birth date. In the Los Angeles area, two Richard Robinsons have the same birth date as Elnita's brother. The first one Margaret gets on the phone tells her he is white. The other Richard Robinson does not have a listed phone number, but Margaret finds his address. He started calling some of the neighbors. Uh, a couple of neighbors down, down about four or five houses down the street. There's a kid named Ferguson. Margaret asks a favor of the 25-year-old Julius Ferguson. I think that there is a gentleman down the street, about three or four houses down the street, and I want to give you my number because I can't get a hold of this guy. I have, um, he doesn't have, um, he's not listed, he's an unlisted phone number. I said, look, I'll even give you $25 if you just go down there and, 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 and ask him a couple of questions. And I said, by the way, I'm looking for a man who is African American. <laughs> this kid was really cute because he said, oh, no, ma'am, we're all black here. <laughs> I said, no, no, I wasn't care if you're all black. I said, I want to know if he's African-American because I need, you know, I'm looking for a person who it may be the potential heir to the estate of this, of his brother. And I need to know if he comes from Lake Charles, Louisiana. So the guy wrote it all down. He says, well, you know, ma'am, I go by there every day with my dog. And I sit on that porch and I chat with this gentleman every day. Ferguson sets off to question his elderly neighbor. Is Margaret Galasso on the verge of cracking a half century old mystery? I nearly fell off the chair. God bless him, I nearly fell off the chair. I couldn't believe it. I say, are you telling me the truth? Most of Wilbur's Robinson estate has been plundered by an unscrupulous lawyer. To access the remaining money, Margaret Galasso needs to find two missing Robinson brothers, potential heirs to the estate. Walter is dead, but the youngest brother, Richard, may still be alive. And the trail leads to an address in Palmdale, California. Margaret enlists a neighbor to investigate. He went down there and he asked Richard all these questions. He says, are you from Lake Charles, Louisiana? Yes, Richard says, I'm from Lake Charles, Louisiana. And he says, um, you got a brother named Wilbur? Yes, ma'am, I got a brother named Wilbur. Margaret has finally tracked down Elnita's long lost brother. They had some people down the street that lived for me. And uh, they bought a a slip of paper told me to call, told me to call this number. When I called her, she asked me, was I Richard Robinson? I told her, yes, I'm Richard Robinson. I said, um, okay, can you tell me where in Lake Charles, Louisiana are, are you from? What street did you live on? 
in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Well, I nearly fell off the chair. God bless him, I nearly fell off the chair when he told me Goose Boulevard. So she says, uh, she said, I'm so glad that I got a hold of you. She said, uh, I'm going to call your sister, and you'll be able to talk to your sister. Richard immediately breaks the news to his wife. And within minutes, Margaret Colasso puts Elnita Robinson and her long-lost brother in communication through a conference call. She said, um, hello, um, is this Richard Robinson? Yes. And he said, hello, sis? I couldn't believe it. I say, you telling me the truth? He say, but uh, do you think you're gonna have a heart attack? I say, I don't think so. I'm too old to have a heart attack. I couldn't believe that he was still here. You know? But I, in my heart, I was right. I was happy, you know? 47 years. There were 47 years I hadn't seen my sister, 47 years. That's a long time for being away from her. I finally found her. And uh, tears in my eyes. And I said, thank you, Lord. And, uh, and we, uh, just, like a, just like a new day, like a new world, new people, that's it, yeah. Richard, the baby of the family, had been sorely missed. We all very close. I was very close to Anita. Then after she sent for me, she was like a mother to me. She took care of me like a mother. Richard was always just a sweet person, real sweet, a pushover for another woman. So why did he lose touch? The Navy took Richard a long way from the Robinson family. I left uh, Seattle. I went by uh, my ship, went back to Long Beach. Then after that, I, uh, I traveled to uh, the Philippines and all, and uh, just, lost, uh, just lost my family, that is it. I just necessarily lost track of them. Over the years, Richard tried many times to reconnect with his family. He even had the Navy visit Elnita's former home to help track her down without success. After the Navy couldn't find her, then I hired me a, a private investigator, which I knew they would try to find him, and he couldn't find him. So actually, I gave up. I was having too much fun in Long Beach, and uh, to tell the truth about it, I just uh, put my family down. And that's the worst thing I ever do, is put my family down. I should have found them. It's my fault. I should have found my family. Ten years after Wilbur's death, Elnita flies back to L.A., this time to visit her baby brother. Had a grin on him like that. He looked the same. He did, because he was always a big man. He's 76 years old, and he's going strong. <laughs> the remains of Wilbur's family trust was split between Elnita, Richard, and a few of the nieces and nephews. We got $14,000 a piece. I'll tell you what, I went crazy on it. Washer, dryer, stove. And my wife, she went crazy on clothes, that's it. Not a dime, not a dime left. The Robinsons were never able to reclaim the rest of the stolen money. But based on numerous complaints that related to other cases, Robert Cannon was eventually disbarred by the California State Bar in November 2000. No criminal charges were ever filed, and he appears to have vanished without a trace. He, he raked this estate to the, two, to the tune of almost $250,000 to $500,000. Um, he was the Grinch that stole Christmas. I mean, basically, that's the only thing I can say. But without Robert Cannon and the missing family trust, Richard and Elnita would not have found each other. The loss of one brother 
led to the return of another one. He calls me about three to three times a week, and I do the same. If he don't call me, I'll call him, you know? But I'm so thankful to God he's here today. Sometimes you got to wait for a thing to happen. And uh, I prayed, and uh, this would happen. This would really happen. I finally found him. And I was a happy man, yeah. We stuck together now. We. Uh, we are unseparated, that's it. Mm -hmm.